have enjoyed every bit of it. I wake up every day with new dreams, so I feel like I'm just starting out. I'm proud of all of it, I have to honestly say, because you never know when you start out how you're gonna be known or thought of when you're older. It is truly difficult to overstate the achievements of Dolly Parton. One of the most successful musicians of all time, Dolly has managed to stay relevant in pop culture for over 60 years, pinning some of the greatest country songs of all time, bagging herself numerous prestigious awards, and constantly finding inspiration to keep her creative drive going. From humble beginnings in the heart of the Smoky Mountains, to becoming an icon of American culture. I love people and maybe it shows because I just love people and I've always been so grateful that people have accepted me and loved me all through the years and followed my career and kept food on my table, so to speak. <laughs> Dolly has conquered not only the music scene, but the entire entertainment industry as a whole. I think my mom and dad would be very proud of me. I always think they're looking down and saying, you go, girl. We knew you could do it, and we love you. Topping charts, making millions, touring around the world, and all the while keeping her southern country girl charm and self-deprecating humor, regardless of the many trials and tribulations she has faced throughout her long and storied career. Over her tenure, Dolly has spread love, happiness, and positivity to all. On January 19, 1946, Dolly Rebecca Parton was born in Locust Ridge, Tennessee. As one of 12 children born to A.B. Lee Caroline and Robert Lee Parton and grew up in a one-room shack. Living in relative poverty, the shack housed up to 14 people and because of this, some children, up to three or four, had to sleep in the same bed every night. Dolly has recounted that during the winter, the home was just as cold inside as it was outside. Dolly's father worked in the mountains of Tennessee as a sharecropper, who occasionally worked construction jobs to make ends meet. Meanwhile, Avi was a homemaker. Her father was illiterate, but Dolly often says that despite that fact, he was one of the smartest people she had ever known concerning business and making a profit. She credits him for her business savvy and her mother's family for her musical abilities. From a family where a lot of country poor people from big families didn't get a chance to go to school, get an education. My dad being one of them, they couldn't read and write, and it was kind of crippling to him. Dolly once recounted a story where all of the kids agreed to give up their Christmas gifts for her father to afford a wedding ring for Avi. I must have been eight or 10 years old, and my mother had never had a wedding ring. There was a house full of kids around that time, and Daddy decided he was finally going to buy Mama a wedding ring. Of course, that meant that nobody else was going to get any gifts. That cost money. However, despite the lack of gifts, Dolly said that it was one of their happiest Christmases because of how joyful they made their mother. Regardless of the poor life the family had, Dolly has said nothing but positive things about her early life. The family had love, kindness, and understanding, and in their minds, it's all they needed to be happy. Parton would later incorporate her poverty-stricken past into the lyrics of her music. In Parton's song, Coat of Many Colors, she sings about how her mother stitched together a coat for her out of rags given to the family. As she stitched it together, she told Dolly the Bible story of Joseph and his coat of many colors. The excited child, with patches on my britches and holes in both my shoes, rushed to school just to find the others laughing and making fun of her for wearing a coat made of rags. And I recall a box of rags someone gave us and how 
how my mama put those rags to use. Now there were rags of many colors, but every piece was small. I didn't have a coat, and it was way down in the fall. Mama sewed the rags together, so in every piece with love she made my coat of many colors that I was so proud of. My very favorite personal song, for personal reasons, is my little song of Coat of Many Colors, mm -hmm. because it's a true story about a little coat my mother made for me, and it really talks about poor people, that you don't have to have money to be rich. You can be rich in love and patience and kindness and understanding. And the fact that my mother made the little coat with love made it very special. And even though music came natural to me, my mother's people were all very musical, I was the one that really wanted to write all those you know, all the stories, so like Coat of Many Colors or Jolene, rather than just writing simple songs, I really love to tell a story and I become whatever I'm writing about. I become that character. From as early as the age of seven, Dolly had an interest in music, teaching herself to play the guitar via a homemade one, and even made her first public performances on local Knoxville radio stations by the age of just 10 years old, going on to record the single Puppy Love at the age of just 13. When she appeared at the Grand Old Opry concert, she met Johnny Cash, who encouraged her to follow her instincts when it came to her music career. The sun never shines through this window of mine. It's dark at the home of the blue. Oh, but the place. During the time Dolly was trying to break through and start a music career, the country music scene was dominated by men. Dolly, even at a young age, was determined to create a female identity within the industry and a much needed female perspective. Once Dolly had graduated from Sevier County High School in 1964, she moved to Nashville the very next day. Here, she pursued her music as a full-time career and signed with the Monument label. However, they were more interested in marketing Parton as a pop singer rather than a country singer. Despite this, Dolly stepped up to the challenge and penned several catchy pop songs. However, her big break came in 1966 when the country singer Bill Phillips heard the demo Dolly recorded for her song, Put It Off Until Tomorrow. Phillips was impressed and requested her to re-record the song and sing the harmony with him on the track. The song became one of the biggest country hits of 1966, and just like that, suddenly Parton became a big name in the music industry, going on to release her first true solo hit, Dumb Blonde, which managed to make the charts in 1967. In 1964, Dolly met her future husband, Carl Thomas Dean, just outside the wishy-washy laundromat in Nashville. She was 18, and he was 21. It was Parton's first day in the Music City, having just moved from Tennessee. Parton caught Dean's eye as he drove by in his white pickup truck. It seemed as if their story was the lyrics of a country song from the very beginning. My first thought was, I'm gonna marry that girl. Dean shared when they renewed their vows at their 50th wedding anniversary celebration in 2016. His second thought was, Lord, she's good looking. Dolly recalls their first years of dating. When I met my husband, he wanted to take me out to dinner. He pulled up to the drive-in window and got our food at McDonald's. He only likes to go places where he can be comfortable. Two years later, in 1966, Parton and Dean tied the knot at a church in Ringgold, Georgia. 
the only attendees were Parton's mother, the preacher, and his wife. The newlyweds decided to elope, as Dolly's record label, Monument, were very worried that getting married would get in the way of her music career. A married woman wouldn't sell as well to a male audience. They asked her to think about it, and Parton, in typical Southern fashion, responded, I ain't waiting. And we, we've loved each other, and we kind of grew into, you know, to a lot of the real deep feelings that we share. And he's very independent, and I don't, uh, I want him to do what makes him happy. He wants me to do what uh, makes me happy. We're not jealous of each other as far as what, you know, our personality or of other people. And I don't know, we're together enough to really keep it exciting and apart. Dean is a shy, rarely photographed man who to this day stays well out of the spotlight. After her breakthrough success with Put It Off Until Tomorrow, Dolly and her husband were invited to a BMI dinner in 1966, which was the first and last industry event she and her husband attended together. In fact, when the night's festivities were over, Dean made it clear that he wanted nothing to do with the entertainment business. Dolly recalls, this was my first big record. It went to number one for Bill, and it was BMI's song of the year. So Carl and I got dressed up, he was in a tux, and we drove to the dinner. We got out, walked up the red carpet, and went inside and sat through dinner and the awards. After the dinner, Carl turned to me and said, Dolly, I want you to have everything you want, and I'm happy for you, but don't you ever ask me to go to another one of them dang things again. My husband and I get along great. It's his first marriage and mine. And we like each other, but he does not want to be in the press. He's proud of me. He's proud for me. He loves hearing about it. He loves show business, as long as he can watch it from, uh, from his distance. chair and from, his, <laughs> from a distance. But we get along great because he does not want the limelight, and he's a homebody, and I love to travel. So we, you know, we get along wonderful with that, and I make it a point to protect his privacy and to protect our home life. And when I go home, that is private. And so it's true that you, you can have it all if you just work it right. However... Parton credits their difference to the success of their five decades long relationship. Dolly has said, They say that opposites attract, and it's true. We're doing the complete opposite, but that's what makes it fun. I never know what he's going to say or do. He's always surprising me. In 1967, Dolly's career changed forever with the help of Porter Wagner. Dolly was hired to replace the former star of his TV show, Norma Jean. Initially, the switch was an unpopular decision. Fans of the Porter Wagner show were unhappy and were very reluctant to accept Parton, at times even chanting loudly in the audience for Norma Jean's return. With Wagoner's assistance, however, Parton was eventually accepted. Parton and Wagoner have undeniable chemistry. Their voices blend together beautifully. A lot of requests, a lot of good requests. Dolly and I are gonna do all duets this week. Got a whole bunch of them us. Starting with this. It's a lesson to live. It was because of her success on the show that Wagoner convinced his record label, RCA, to sign Dolly. However, RCA wanted to protect their investment by releasing the first single as a duet with Wagoner. Yet, before long, 
Dolly was more of a success than Wagoner himself. I started with a, a show called The Porter Wagoner Show back in 1967, and he used to wear a lot of rhinestone suits and, and all that, and that was the thing to do in, in country music. So once I got into that, I'd already been wearing the hair and the makeup. I thought, oh, yes, you got to shine. If you're going to go on stage, you need to shine. Let people see you like you're a star. In the early 70s, Dolly topped the U.S. country chart with her single, Joshua, before releasing one of her most beloved albums, Coat of Many Colors, in 1971. It was clear that Dolly was emerging as a solo country star in the making. Of course, the most iconic part in song is Jolene, which topped the country chart in late 1973 and managed to reach the lower regions of the Hot 100. The song walks the line between dignity and desperation. However, its origin is more lighthearted than you may think. The song was inspired by a flirty bank teller who had a crush on Parton's husband. Though Dolly wasn't threatened by this, as the song might suggest, instead, it's more of a running joke between her and her husband. Parton has said that if it had not been for that woman, she would have never written Jolene, and she wouldn't have made all that money. So she says, thank you, Jolene. Parton has always had a great deal of respect for Porter helping her into the country music scene. But she knew, in 1974, after seven years on the show, it was time for her to leave. Dolly walked into his office and played him a new song she had written. That song was, I Will Always Love You. Wagoner did not take the news well. After the split, he created a lot of negative press about Dolly. He wanted to sue her for $3 million, claiming that she had breached her contract. Dolly and Wagoner settled this agreement out of court, with Parton eventually paying him $1 million. At this point in her career, she did not have this kind of money. It would take her years to pay him back in full. Dolly has said, he got as much out of me as I got out of him, let's put it that way. Porter was very much like my dad and my brothers and the men I grew up with. They were just manly men, and a woman's place was where you told her to be. And so I would always stand up to him, because I had my own talent. I didn't come here just to be the girl singer on Porter Wagner's show. And we fought like hell, and he showed his ass about it, rather than just letting life flow. He had to sue me, and of course that broke both our hearts. And, you know, looking back on it now, he hates that he did that and has said so. Although Dolly felt betrayed by Porter, she forgave him. They became friends again, and she was even at his bedside in 2007 when he sadly passed away. Dolly's look is iconic. A blonde wig, full makeup, big bosoms and a tiny waist is synonymous with the singer. Her iconic catchphrase being, it cost a lot of money to look this cheap. Unlike other stars, Dolly has always been honest about her love of plastic surgery enhancements and proud of her huge collection of amazing wigs and extremely form-fitting bedazzled stage outfits. 
small town America who wouldn't be able to see Broadway. Give them a glimpse of what goes on here. Do you agree with that? I do agree with that. Yeah, and this is fun. I think people always love seeing people get all dressed up. And we're just like kids. I felt like I was getting ready for the prom. I said, how big shall I make my hair? How far shall I push my boobs up? How, how shall my shoes be? So, <laughs> but it was fun. I spent all afternoon getting ready. She has in the past referenced that she went for her trademark trash look of blonde hair, makeup, and tight-fitting clothes from the local town tramp. Yeah, two questions. When you go on the road, what is the one thing you cannot be without when you tour? Oh, my wigs and my makeup. Good my clothes, but especially my hair and makeup. <laughs> She claims that she isn't a natural beauty, but more of a plain Jane. And when young, she yearned to be glamorous. Talking about her look, Dolly has said, all country girls have an idea of what glamor is, and a lot of them get that through magazines or movies. But we didn't get to go to the movies, and we lived way back, so my look was inspired by the town tramp. Throughout the 60s and 70s, Parton was approached numerous times in the 70s to pose nude for Playboy, which she turned down. However, in 1978, she finally did appear, albeit not nude, on the front cover in a Playboy bunny outfit, cementing her as a sex symbol across America and a symbol of the U.S. in general. I gotta ask you the fashion thing here, because you and I almost look like sisters, we don't do. you think? <laughs> we've got, we've got the, the full-on blonde well, we hair. We certainly do. And the, 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 well, <laughs> I wish, but <laughs> how many? You look better in yours than No, me. no, no, no. I trade any day. How many parties did you get invited to tonight, and how did you choose I Vanity? Didn't, I didn't even get invited to this one. I oh. just, I'm just crashing the party. You're crashing I'm the party with my manager, Sandy. Oh, actually, well. I did get invited, and I'm glad to be here. Yeah. See you. Good to see you too. In the mid 1970s, Mac Davis received a phone call from Dolly, who wanted advice on what to do next as she was struggling in her country music career after splitting from her musical partner. Davis suggested that she reach out to Sandy Gallen, who quickly became inseparable. She has said that nobody could quite get how the Christian Southern girl and the New York Jewish boy could have so much in common, but it was real. Because Dolly's husband, Carl Dean, did not like to travel, Sandy, who was gay, accompanied Dolly around the world. During this period, with the help of Gallen, Parton began to embark on a high-profile crossover campaign, attempting to aim her music in a more mainstream direction and increase her visibility outside the confines of country music. With her 1976 album, All I Can Do, which was the last album she produced with Porter Wagoner, Parton began taking more of an active role in production. Dolly aimed for the pop market, but hoped to keep her country fan base happy too. By 1977, she was on her 20th solo album in just 10 years. She had written every style of country song you could think of. Pop music was limitless in a way that country music could never be, in terms of sound and commercially too. Jolene proved she could take country with her over to the mainstream. And on her next album, Here You Come Again, she again attempted to find a place in both worlds. This crossover album became her first million seller, topping the country album chart and reaching number 20 on the Billboard 200. The title track topped the country singles chart and became Parton's first top 10 single on the pop chart, reaching number three. The next release from the album was the double A-side, Two Doors Down, It's All Wrong, But It's All Right, which topped the country chart but also made it into the pop top 20. In this clip of Dolly singing Two Doors Down, the slight difference in style to appeal to a wider audience is apparent. The album also brought her first Grammy Award for Best Female Country Vocal Performance. Parton started to expand her audience, wisely turning her talents to television. She proved to be a natural, 
and was often on talk shows and TV specials. Well, I wanted to be a star, but I always thought of a star more of uh, as a singing star and being on the Grand Ole Opry, being on stage and performing. But uh, I figured that if my career went the way I wanted it to, that I would eventually wind up doing the movies and, and Vegas. And it was a real fun thing. But it was Parton's big screen debut that really propelled her into the mainstream. Well, I think Jane is a very complex person. I think she's very intelligent, very creative. I find her uh, very caring, but I find her also very shy and uh, almost uh, naive in a very sweet little girl way. And it's a side of her that I really uh, was surprised to, uh, you know, to find. Her charming, effervescent personality translated easily to the screen. Dolly sparkled. She played a brassy Southern woman, Dora Lee Rhodes, in 9 to 5, opposite Lily Tomlin and Jane Fonda in 1980. Well, it was great. At that time, uh, you know, nothing like that had been done in, in the movies, and we weren't sure if it would do well at all. But men also loved it because it was very entertaining, tying up the balls. It had a lot of fun stuff in it. And that was my very first movie that I ever made, and it didn't make a big difference, and it has helped a lot through the years. I love Jane and Lily and Dabney Coleman, the ones I've performed with in the show. We've always stayed close through the years. Nine to Five went on to become the highest grossing comedy film of the year, also earning Parton an Oscar nomination and a pair of Grammy Awards for the now classic theme song. In the film, the co-workers decide to hold their sexist, egotistical, lying, hypocritical bigot of a boss, Mr. Hart, Dabney Coleman, hostage and transform their oppressive workplace into one of equality. The hilarious over-the-top hijinks couldn't disguise the film's more resonant message, which is only strengthened in the era of Time's Up and Me Too. You can see in the music video for the hit song different clips from the film that show the women taking back power in the workplace. Mr. Hart spends his days harassing Dora Lee by telling her she's much more to him than just a dumb secretary. He lies about sleeping with her and purposely knocks pencils on the floor so she'll lean over and pick them up. He insults Judy and bullies Violet. After learning she lost out on a promotion to a man she trained, Violet confronts Mr. Hart. Spare me the women's lib crap, he replies. In order to hide the fact that they're holding their boss hostage, the women have to run the business as best they can, which, it turns out, is much better than Mr. Hart. They implement flexible schedules and a job-sharing program, set up a daycare center, and ensure equal pay. Dolly was able to pull from real-life experiences for the role of Dora Lee. Well, no, I, I was excited about it because it was the kind of thing that was so close to, to my own personality that I, you know, I didn't feel like I had really had to act or, or worry too much about it, although, you know, it wasn't all that great, but I mean, it wasn't like a real scary thing. The film was the catalyst for a TV series in the 1980s and a Broadway musical which transferred to London's West End. The 9 to 5 musical continues to resonate with audiences in the theater scene to this day. I feel very honored and proud. How did that happen? You're already an icon. You don't have to go back to Broadway and do this. What, what? Well, I've never done Broadway. This is the first time I've done anything here. And so when Bob Greenblatt, who produced the 9 to 5 musical, uh, he asked me if I'd write it since I had written a theme song 30 years ago for the movie with Jane Fun and Lily Tomlin. And so I said, well, I'll give it a try. And uh, I did. And four, year, four years later or more, here we are. Amazing. I think people are under the impression that she kind of popped in and popped out. She was an integral part of our daily rehearsal. And um, she was there, I think she just recently left maybe three or four days ago. She was there for every preview performance, in the wings, giving us high fives, the greatest support. And, you know, you see the glamour and the wigs and the lame and the nails, but that woman is smart. And when the music starts, her head goes down, the wheels start turning, and she can give you a new lyric or a new melody in 20 minutes. And I just have the greatest respect for her. Exploit it every night. I'm working with Dolly Parton. You know, she's brilliant. The thing that's brilliant about Dolly is, is this is a woman that does not need to do this. She wants to do this. It's a first-time experience for an icon. 
and to have shared that with her and collaborated with her, and it's her first time collaborating like this. To have people sit down and say, I need this or I need that, where well, she's not used to that. And she's been so open to the process and really gotten into it. It's an honor. Well, I feel great. I feel proud and honored and humbled by the whole thing. It's one thing to get a chance to write something for Broadway, but it's another entirely to be nominated for a Tony Award. So it's, it's been a great thrill for me. It's just like it won't die. It's the gift that keeps on giving. Because 9 to 5, as you know, we did that in 79. It came out in 80. And uh, that was part of my deal was that I would write the theme song. And you hope for the best. You hope you get a good song. But the fact that the movie did so well and the song did so well and it just keeps going and going. And then we had, I wrote the musical for Broadway and then it traveled around the United States for a while. And now, all of a sudden, they decided to put it here. And it's like really... Uh, got a new new life and a new reason and a new purpose. In the 80s, Dolly starred in another big Hollywood movie, Steel Magnolias. You laugh, you cry, you, it brings you closer to family, it brings you closer to friends. It's about family, love and friendship and people and life in a small town. And I think it's just about the human heart. And was in the pop charts with not only 9 to 5, but another classic hit, Islands in the Stream. This duet with Kenny Rogers knocked Bonnie Tyler's Total Eclipse of the Heart off the top spot of the Billboard Hot 100 and is often credited as the best karaoke song and top duet of all time. Dolly has a very close bond with the other female country singers in the business, such as Tammy Wynette and Loretta Lynn, and made the collaboration album Trio with Emmylou Harris and Linda Ronstadt longtime friends and admirers of one another, the singers first attempted to record an album together in the mid-1970s, but scheduling conflicts and other difficulties, including the fact that the three women all recorded for different record labels, prevented its release. The album won the Grammy Award for Best Country Performance by a Duo or Group with Vocal. It was also nominated for Album of the Year alongside Michael Jackson, U2, Trends, and Whitney Houston. This decade also saw the establishment of her 150-acre Dollywood theme park. Dolly, who grew up in the area, bought an interest in Silver Dollar City in the Great Smoky Mountains of Eastern Tennessee. As part of the deal, the original park reopened for the 1986 season as Dollywood. Martin said she became involved with the operation because she always thought that if she made it big or got successful at what she had started out to do, she wanted to come back to her part of the country and do something great, something that would bring a lot of jobs into this area. Dollywood has approximately 4,000 people on its payroll, making it the largest employer in the community. From 1986 to 2010, the park doubled in size to 150 acres. Dolly even wrote and recorded a song that she then placed in a Dreambox time capsule, which was buried in the park, planning for it to be opened on her 100th birthday. The song's name, My Place in History, acts as a final tribute to her fame and legacy, but we will have to wait until 2046 to hear it. One charity project close to her heart is the Imagination Library, which Dolly started in 1996 in Sevier County, Tennessee, where she was raised. I think any time that you, when you become a star and when you get in a position to help, you should help. And I think you should find charities that are near and dear to your heart. Children whose families sign up are sent in the post free books funded by a charitable giving. Library where we give books to children. From the time they're born, they get a book a month until they start school. Growing up with only the Bible in her house, she has said she was inspired by the example of her father, who worked hard but didn't have the chance to learn to read or write. She thought, well, I'm gonna do this, to get books in the hands of children because if you can read, 
you can educate yourself. We're very excited about the Imagination Library being here. I gotta make sure I say your town right. It's Rotherham? Did I get it right? I've been practicing. Cause it don't look like that on paper. In the States, anything that's H-A-M, we have to say Rotherham, right? Like Birmingham. Anyway, so we are very happy to be here. And of course, the Imagination Library is a program very dear to my heart because this is something we started back in the States about 10 years ago. It was something just for my people in my county, in my hometown. And of course, it just kind of took off and now it's all over the United States. The initiative expanded across the US in 2000, then set up in the UK in 2007 and Australia in 2013. Today, more than one million books make their way to children around the world every month. She has donated over 100 million children's books, and it's something she is passionate about continuing. So I wanted to start where children can learn at a very early age to love books, to learn, to read. It helps to bring the family together. You have, must pick up a child if it gets its own little book in the mail, which they do with its own little name. You know, they're gonna, you're gonna have to read to that child. So it is my belief that if you can read, whether you get a chance to go to college or even to school or to afford it. If you can read, you can self-educate yourself. So it was really about, it started from a very sincere and honest little place. Then it got all over Tennessee. The governor uh, at that time, uh, Governor Phil Bredesen took it. It was all over Tennessee. Then it went all over the United States. Then we went to Canada with it. Then we came to Rotherham here in England. And now we're opening in Scotland. And so it's going to, just a way to get books in the hands of, of kids from the time they're born till they start kindergarten. Dolly also appeals to the younger generation through the help of her goddaughter, Miley Cyrus. So anyway, I have a lot of fans from very young ones from the Hannah Montana show, which I've performed on, who's Miley's my little goddaughter. And of course, I've performed on that a few times. And so we have that little young group, and then all of my fans that kind of have discovered my music, and the younger folks, and then there's the older folks like me that have followed me for a long time. So I've been very fortunate that I've had a lot of fans through the years. Dolly had acted as a mentor to Miley's dad, Billy Ray Cyrus. When Achy Breaky Heart came out, Dolly put Billy Ray on her tour as an opening act. There were even rumors that the two were romantically linked, and even though this was untrue, Billy Ray recalls Parton telling him, that's the stuff that sells records. From that moment on, the two became very good friends. The two gelled as they both had the same roots. They were both country kids at heart. When Miley was born in November 1992, Dolly told Billy Ray, she's got to be my fairy goddaughter and wanted to help her out as much as she possibly could. Since then, Dolly has shared her wisdom at even the stage with Miley and appeared alongside her in various projects. Miley's breakout role was in the Disney series Hannah Montana, in which Dolly played her Aunt Dolly, appearing in several episodes as a guest star who dispenses sage advice to her young niece. Dad, I'm not in the mood to see anybody right now. Well, fine. <laughs> If you don't want to see me, I would just turn that bus around and head on back to Nashville. Look at you, my goodness. You are sprouting like a rose bush after a month of rain. Only not as wet and twice as pretty. Parton <laughs> credits Miley least in part with giving her a fan base that spans generations. She has said that it's been so amazing that I've had all these little kids that grew up with that, and now they have their little kids. All through the generations, they keep bringing me back around, and I love it. But that has been a true joy, and no matter whatever happens with the show, if it lasts forever or just a, a month, it, I wouldn't take nothing for this experience. Dolly's work musically has been extremely influential as well, with countless artists following in her shoes by recording various versions of her songs. In fact, when Elvis Presley wanted to record Dolly's song, I Will Always Love You, Arden was approached for the publishing rights. But being a bright businesswoman, she declined the request, 
as she would be signing away her royalties for the song. It was my most important copyright, Harton said. It broke my heart because Elvis didn't get to sing it, but I had to hold on to it. Even though the king couldn't record the song, Dolly revealed that Elvis privately serenaded his ex-wife Priscilla with the tune as they were leaving the courthouse following their divorce. Of course, 20 years later, the song was turned into a bigger hit by pop star Whitney Houston. This cover put Dolly in the spotlight as a writer and an artist and opened people's eyes to seeing Parton as the talented writer she is. Talking about Whitney's version, Parton has said, I was just a girl with the big hair and big tits and a big personality. But I think that one kind of pointed a finger at me as a serious songwriter. And the fact that it did so well, and I was so touched by it and so honored by it that that one will stand out in my mind forever. Uh, two that love the songs like the Put em in the Colors, but everybody suffers heartache. You don't have to be from anywhere, you know, to have your heart broken. We all fall in love. As long as you live, there's something new every day, something happened to someone else, or a conversation you'll have, something you go through that you haven't been through before. And the way that I deal with all that, the joy and the sadness, and even when people I love are going through things, I know they can't write what they would like to get out. I'm able to do that. For them, so uh, it, it's an it's a never endless you know supply of things to write about. Dolly, welcome! Well, it's thank so you so much. You. Good to see all of you. And this is a very exciting day for me. We got all kinds of things going on, and look, I don't have a bit of mud on me so far. Dolly's had the 2014 headline spot at the Glastonbury Festival often credited as one of the best performances at the festival of all time. Well, it's great. Of course, when we were coming in this morning, I was looking at the mud. That was not different from me. I grew up in the mud. My daddy was a farmer. I grew up in East Tennessee over in America. So that was how we made our living on a farm. So uh, I thought, well, this is not all that different. You know, <laughs> mud is mud wherever you are. But anyway, I just saw all the tents, all the people. And I thought, wow, this is exciting. This is fun. So I'm just proud to be part of it. I can't believe after all these years, I've never done Glastonbury before. Well, I, don't, I think usually some of those old sayings like, to thine own self be true you know those things I think if you really take those and know who you are and know what it is that you want to do and just stick to your dreams and don't get sidetracked with other things usually that'll if you've got the talent and you've got the ambition uh, that'll usually happen so uh, I'm not the Dalai Lama if somebody says oh Dolly you always just look so happy I said that's the Botox <laughs> so, <laughs> and the collagen and the <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, Dolly, you're immaculately turned out already. I wonder if oh. you're going to change before stage. Can yes. you give us a, a little chat through what you might be wearing? Well, Any I'm going to wear tips? white because I figured with that many people, I want to be seen from way out there. So I figured I would probably wear white because I thought that looked good with mud. If I got some on me, brown and white usually looks pretty good together. But uh, I usually enjoy wearing white on stage. So uh, I thought, well, I, I kind of probably will wear that. So it's just the opposite of the brown. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Parton was able to become the real showgirl with highlights from her discography, from Two Doors Down to I Will Always Love You and her classic, Jolene. been around a long time and I, I've been in and out of this part of the world many times through the years so I think people just kind of feel like they know me I feel like more like a family relative than a than a celebrity I think they just kind of think oh Dolly's come home because I always say that I always see somebody I love and everybody I meet like a family member somebody always reminds me of somebody else but I just love people and I've always been so grateful that people have accepted me and loved me all through the years and followed my career and kept food on my table, so to speak. <laughs>
Dolly continues to inspire younger music stars, the likes of Carrie Underwood, Taylor Swift, and Casey Musgraves. Parton's influence can be seen throughout the 21st century music landscape. If I had grown up with, with men, my, I have six brothers and my dad and my uncles, I was always close to you know, all the men in my family. I've known a lot of great men. So I never was, you know, I didn't think about it that much. Of course, I've been hit on all my life. You know, any young girl would be. But a lot of that I just took as a compliment. But I never, you know, I never did anything to try to get ahead in the business. You know, I never slept with anybody unless I wanted to. And I'd never put myself in a position where I tried to stay out of those positions. And if I found myself, in that, I was lucky that I had a great personality and a great sense of humor that I could joke my way out of a lot of it. And then if I couldn't, I have enough temper and backbone that I would kind of get out of it some other way. But I did work. It was a man's world back then, and I, I enjoyed it. And so people were kind to me more than anything, so they kind of looked at me like a young, like a sister or something, seemed to me at the time. But I didn't care how they saw it. I was there to do a job. I had something that I felt that could make us a lot of money, and I would say that. I have something that you know, I think we can all prosper from, and I've been lucky. Musgraves told Billboard, beauty, sex appeal, brains, wit, humor, beautiful songwriting, meaningful songwriting, no apologies for who she is, LGBTQ advocate long before it was even a thing, or trendy, or whatever. She's fearless, and I admire her spirit. And I think that I just live my femininity. I and mean, I'm not a, people say, are you a feminist? I say, I don't know. I don't know exactly what that means. I'm proud to be a woman. I'm proud to be a woman in business. I'm proud to, to do what I do. But I like to just live it. I like to be an example. And you're right. I wrote some of the, my first uh, single on RCA Records back in the 60s. It was called Just Because I'm a Woman. And it, it addressed the issues that we're addressing now. And then I've, all through the years I've written, you know, these songs that, that were to strengthen and to uh, empower women, but just people, you know, in general. Parton has her own museum, a taught class at the University of Tennessee titled Dolly Parton's America, From Sevierville to the World, and even her own Netflix series, Dolly Parton's Heartstrings, with each episode based on one of her iconic songs. Dolly's charity and philanthropy continued even during the COVID-19 pandemic. Parton donated $1 million to the vaccine research, which ultimately helped fund the critical early stages of the Moderna vaccine. Dolly's career continues to grow and evolve her music, releasing Rockstar in 2023, her first dip into the rock genre, reaching number three in the U.S. charts and showing just how long-standing her popularity is even this deep into her career, being able to switch entire genres and still retain her fan base. Dolly Parton's career is long and winding, spanning over six decades and encapsulates so much more than just music. Her charity and philanthropy work, her acting, her theme park have all contributed to her lasting legacy. Inspiring generations of young women with no signs of winding down her career. Dolly Parton's legacy is as warming and heartfelt as her personality. Well, I don't try to tell other people what to do. People are always saying, what kind of advice would you give? I say, I don't give people advice. I have information. If you want to know some facts and if you want to know, you know, sometimes how I dealt with something. But I do believe that everybody has a right to be themselves. Everybody has their own path and their own road to walk. And everybody's talent is different. And I think that we have to kind of base, you know, just how we look, how crazy, you know, the people look, all the, you know, the images that you know, that people have. It's what they feel right about in themselves, and I think they have a right to do that. So I, it's not up to me to tell them not to do it, because who am I to tell anybody what to do? I mean, I look like, uh, you know, the town tramp, and that's how I patterned my look after the town tramp. So who am I to tell somebody else how to dress or what to do? She continues to encourage and influence the music industry to this day, and through speaking her mind and heart, is ultimately a positive influence on the world. Well, I'm 
proud of all of it, I have to honestly say, because you never know when you start out how you're going to be known or thought of when you're older, you, you hope for the best. But I'm really proud of the Imagination Library, the, the project that I've done where we give books to children. But I've been very proud of everything that I've accomplished to be in the Songwriters Hall of Fame because my songwriting is very important. But I won't mind being known as the book lady, but I want to be known for my music as well and to have left something great in the world that wasn't there before I came along.